So I've just come out. Up. There we are. There we are. That's oh, perfect. excellent. So everybody, as you'll have gathered, this is going to be an informal chit chat. Um, I've just come out of a brilliant session on climate change. So this is actually, you know, kind of quite a relevant segue as Alex, who is the MP for Leeds Northwest, I think since 2017. Yeah, feel like a lot longer than that. Um, was one of the U well, he was the UK, uh, what was it, global parliamentary co rapporteur at the COP. Um, and I think there were 200 parliamentarians selected from across the world to work together at the COP. And so uh, it's, it's really great that you're here today, not least because I believe we might get into this that there is a big correlation actually between what states are not doing or have not historically done about climate change and electoral systems, which Zach Polanski also just touched on in the session that, that we had, which was, by the way, brilliant. So those of you who weren't at it, please listen to the recording. Um, Izzy Warren just restored my faith, I think, in the world. <laughs> and I kind of wish that she were old enough to get elected into Westminster, which in a year, I think she will be. Um, it was absolutely brilliant, um, as was Dottie from Global Justice Now um, and Zach from the Green Party. Um, and the thing that really struck me as they all spoke was how stuck we are with this electoral system, which keeps returning to as very unprogressive <laughs> government in the UK. So I wanted to ask you as a starter, Alex, MP since 2017 um, and chair, I think, of CERA which is yeah. uh, the parliamentary group Sarah, yeah. the parliamentary group so you're clearly a, a big um <clears throat> climate you know you've got a track record of working on climate to what extent you know that or any other policy area is what motivates you is this just about you waking up one morning and thinking my vote never counts um what, you know why is it that you back election yeah i mean actually what you'll find is that there's a funny correlation of and it's not absolute of Labour MPs who support uh, electoral form and Labour MPs who are involved in the student movement in NUS. So I was um, like you, Laura, I was uh, on the executive of my student union. Um, you know, so was Clive Lewis, you know, West Street was president of NUS, et cetera, et cetera. If you just look up and down the list, there are some honourable exceptions, but, but the, a lot of the people um, came to understand a lot about elections and electoral systems by going through the student movement and stu obviously student elections i don't think anybody runs at the first past the post anywhere most of the elections are under stv um with this great character ron who runs in every single election everywhere which is reopen nominations very rarely wins but always always competes um uh, and you could see the stark difference between those elections and how they were run and um, how council or Westminster elections are run. And that's actually particularly stark um, was for me at the time at NUS where, you know, there were uh, quite a lot of left candidates, so we put it that way. And, um, you know, the left did win at certain points. So Cap Fletcher, for instance, who um, people might know when the president of NUS from the left and when I was a SAB, um, there was 16 votes short of the left winning. Then first past the post, the left would never got anywhere near any of those because um you know one of the maybe shortcomings of the left is that they they're quite good at splitting and maybe not so good at uniting but the electoral system helped unite them um because and the right vote was generally piled up and didn't actually do well under um uh under stv and i think the same will go in a general election and the problem now is we've got all of the rights votes piled up in one place, the regressive reactionary sort of vote in the Conservative Party, and then the progressive and left vote and, and even sort of progressive liberal vote split across lots and lots of parties. And so, you know, so it, it, it's, it's, there's a logic to it. You know, it's also about, you know, the, the votes, the votes don't match, you know, the seats don't match the votes. And so that was also very stark. You know, I lived, I grew up um, in my teen years. So my, my early years, I lived in Sheffield, Labour always won. And then in my teen years, I lived in Beaconsfield, the Tories always won. Yeah. When I was in Sheffield, everybody was Labour that I knew, fine. Where, where I lived in Beaconsfield, lots of, lots of us hated, you know, Major and Thatcher and stuff like that. And But they always won in Beaconsfield, so that seemed a bit unfair, you know. Um, so, 
you know, so it's, all of that came through. If you lived it, you've lived in very safe constituencies. It also comes through. You know, I live in, in supposedly a marginal now, so it's a bit different. I'm also the, I'm also the MP, so it's a bit different now. But um, but you know, it's actually probably now against my own interests. I'm probably arguing something against my interests, but it's the right thing to do. Yeah, well, quite right. And of course, it's not against your own interests because the thing that I find fascinating about the electoral reform debate in Westminster, as opposed to the one that you have out there in political parties. Um, is how much MP MPs think it's all about them. And actually, it's not all about them. It is about the government that we get. And one of the challenges is elevating this to a more kind of strategic level discussion. And I know MPs, you know, think, yeah, but they love me in constituency, blah. I know everybody. I go to every school fate. They've never managed without me. It's not true, actually. You know, there's a portion of the vote which is personal and most of it is the party. But it's obviously much more important to us all as progressives that we get the right party in government that then we necessarily keep Mrs Smith, who we might have grown attached to. Um, yes, and someone says, my mum is 69 and has never voted for a candidate at constituency that won the election. Um, yeah, I'm not far off 69. I'm starting to feel like that myself. Um, so, so we both want to change the system. With apologies to everyone here who is not in the Labour Party, um, we know that we can't change this system unless we get Labour on board. That is, of course, the very nature of the system that we are with. One of the two parties has to basically decide that they want PR, either to implement it through a bill in government, which is what the Labour campaign for a new democracy wants, um, or to say yes to a referendum, which is what some others would like. But either way, we don't get Labour or the Tories on board, we don't get PR. Let's just discount with apologies to any Conservatives who are here who are pro-PR, but the Tory party is not going to back it because it doesn't suit it to back it. Partly as because, as you described, we've got these safe seats where the votes pile up and that works for the Tories. Um, so we need to shift the Labour Party. So I want to talk to you a bit about where, <clears throat> where that is. Now, the numbers are pretty clear from the membership. And thank you to Another Europe is Possible and indeed to Open Labour. And Alex is the uh, one of the co-founders of Open Labour and is, in the is the parliamentary rep for it. So thanks to both <coughs> these organisations <coughs> for backing the PR campaign. We've done brilliantly with the membership. You know, we got more motions pro PR, went to conference that went than went against Brexit in 2018, just to give a sense of the scale of membership interest. Um, over half of constituency Labour parties now have policy pro PR and in Brighton at conference we had a vote um, where 80% of CLP delegates backed PR. Now in the end of course there's only one number that counts, the one number that counts is the final vote which is the one which is the mix of the members and the trade unions and we didn't quite get there with the trade unions um, but but you know sense of moral victory and indeed you know we did bank a sort of relative win. I guess it feels a bit like 2017 election felt for Labour in a way. Um, but I want you to talk to me about what these numbers mean, about the politics that sit behind them, about why the membership are in one place and the unions are maybe somewhere else, where you think the leadership are. Obviously, you're amongst friends and we promise not to Twitter. So feel free to be honest. Um, but could you talk to us about the politics as you see it? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm fairly on the record on this. I don't think there's a great, there's a great uh, danger um, to me. Um, so I think actually the thing that was surprising was the level of support we got from CLPs. Um, the number of motions, we were, we were way beyond anybody else this year. And actually historically, very few motions have, have got the number of um, motions to conference. And actually general motions passed. I think it's, it's probably a record actually in terms of one issue. And actually, the exact same motion pretty much was passed everywhere with very little amendment. I know I steered it through my CLP that it would have no amendment to it because amendments sometimes aren't friendly. Sometimes they are wrecking, which we learn, something we learn in Parliament. Um, and um, the, I didn't think we'd get the level of support from CLPs we got. I knew the affiliate section would be difficult. And the reason the affiliate section is difficult is because there's a time lag between um, unions moving on issues and the issues becoming unless they are labor if they're labor issues if they're around you know changing world of work or labor disputes or 
you know, fire and rehire, you know, that sort of thing. They're very quick because that's their bread and butter. That's what they do. And that's why we love trade unions. But um, if it's another issue, which is sort of, if you say, um, not part of their core mission, then then they then they generally take longer. Uh, and that's what's happened here. So policy conference of unions, union members are just building up after 2019, really, to um, to start putting policy motions forward on PR. Obviously, we had COVID as well. So that became a priority, which you can absolutely understand, particularly in public sector unions, the COVID became a big priority for them. And so we've only just had our first victory in, 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 in a major union, a big union, that's at Unite. If that, if that policy conference in Unite happened three months earlier, Unite would have gone at lay party conference and voted for the motion and it, it would have passed. So that's where we are. So really where the politics, it's not about politics anymore, it's about organising. So what there might now be from people who, who oppose PR, who support first pass first as well, well, they had a go last year, they failed, leave it for a few years and come back to it later. We've got other things to talk about. And actually the rules mean that we'll have less motions going forward um, next year. But actually, and I don't like this phrase, but I think it's actually appropriate here. This is about one last heave. This is like, we've basically got the numbers now. Let's just bring it to conference next year. We'll get it over the line. I'm quite happy, actually, if we lose next year, after we've got United, say, actually, yeah, maybe let's leave it for a bit because we'll have it two years in a row. But I'm absolutely confident we will. What The only thing I'm worried about is a bit of fatigue. So a bit of fatigue in constituency saying, we passed the motion last year. Why bring the motion back? We want to do something else. About saying, actually, this is the last year we'll bring it because we just need to go back. We just need to win it. And then we then then it's then it's settled labour policy, and then we can work out how we deliver it in the manifesto. And actually, it's a very good motion in terms of it. It 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 it, it isn't maybe like in our hearts, or we probably would maybe like a more radical motion. But we understand where the Labour Party is, and then so this motion actually fits with where we are in the cycle and where we can get to with the manifesto, rather than saying we want an all bells and whistles motion. You know. Not only not only stipulating we're going to change the system, but how we're going to change the system, when we're going to change the system, and you know, and all the rest of it. So, um, so I think I think that we're nearly there, and it just really is a matter of organising and the coalition we brought together this year of keeping and actually expanding it, trying to get organisations who are not fully on board to be fully on board. So, like Momentum supported us at conference, but they're not in the tent. Progress supported at conference, but they're not in the tent. Um, Labour first probably won't be in the tent because John Speller is the most adamantly opposed person I know to PR. TWT, you know, is basically on board but not in the tent. So we just need to grow the tent a little bit and go go to conference that this is not this is not a left right issue in the party, and nobody should try and make it so. This is this is about having the change, being in the moral right, and actually talking about the fact we've got a broken system. This is not the only, but one of the necessary changes we need to make fix the broken constitutional settlement that we have in the UK. Yeah, well, I would disagree with very little of that. There are some tactical questions about how we further this debate, just to clarify to those of you who are lucky enough not to spend your time reading the Labour Party rule group book, the rules changed, which means that you can take a policy motion in consecutive years. So it's absolutely technically possible to take a PR motion back to conference next year. The question is whether it's politically desirable. I think on balance, it probably is. Um, I think I agree with Alex that uh, we are in one last heave territory. Um, I also think we just have to be confident that we are going to bring some more of the trade unions with us. I think uh, the Unite shift is massive. Um, the smaller unions we know have often um, been in the right place on big issues. So the Fire Brigades Union, for example, voted for PR at conference, even though it didn't have policy. Now, that's much easier for a smaller union to do because they can organise themselves such that they actually have the debate at conference and make a decision. Um, obviously, for the bigger beasts, that's not that's not quite so straightforward. Um, I agree. Um, I, you know, I agree about uh, the, the need for us to keep this simple. Like we have not got, and I've just come from an electoral reform society meeting, which is very interesting, <laughs> quite a different crowd to another Europe is possible. Um, and everyone wanted to talk about systems. They all wanted to talk about STV versus multi-member. And we've not done that in this campaign. And I think that's been really important because I think we would have splintered within our own coalition 
it would have become a quite a nerdy sort of specialist subject type campaign. There is obviously going to be a discussion now um, with the Labour, Labour leadership about the kind of PR that they can envisage backing. Um, I'm going to push you a little bit, Alex, on what you think the hesitancies in the leadership are about. What, what is it? And I don't mean Keir Starmer as an individual, because in fact, you could have said the same about Jeremy Corbyn and you could have said the same about Ed Miliband. What is it at the top of the House um, which, which stops Labour politicians from being able to embrace this? And, to, and, and how much can we explain their hesitancy through what those of us who sort of swing between loving and hating Labour would call Labourism? You know, we can just win on our own. H how much of it is about yeah. that? Yeah, I, th I think there's, there's more than one thing and it depends who you're talking to. I think there's one and, and I think the, the first thing I think, I think we need to be alive to it and sort of understand it and actually in some ways go with it is that it's viewed as a second tier issue. It's not a bread and butter issue. It's not a doorstep issue. It's not health or education or the economy. Um, you know, so and I, that is all true. So sort of once it's done, actually, we'll stop talking about it. Once we've changed it, we're not going to carry on campaigning for PR. We're going to go and look at some other democratic reforms, aren't we? So, um, so in that sense, that's right and so you know so so you don't want to elevate it to being the most important thing also partly because it isn't um and um and that that's a sort of hesitancy that they don't want to give it loads of air time because you know and actually it's just we pass it it goes in the manifesto at the back you do it when you're in government that's the end of it that's sort of attitude we should take that's the attitude i take people secondly there is this sort of thing of um there is this sort of laborism, this sort of machismo, which I don't really sign up to, where, you know, we're, we're you know, pe one, that people shouldn't have grades of choice. People should just have, like, a choice. And that, that actually is a very dangerous thing because in 2019, they very much didn't choose labor, right? So, it's, you know, having, having that choice is, is, isn't, always, isn't always something that, that benefits us. And actually, if you look at all the stats, we'd have won a lot more elections under PR, pretty much every single one, actually, since the Second World War. Um, although I think politics would have fractured differently. I'm not saying the right would have been completely frozen out because we'd have been a different dynamic. Um, but um, because, because our vote split, and, but there is this attitude that we, you know, we can win on our own. We just need to get, you know, we just need to win one more seat than the Tories. You know, we just need to get through the 25 MPs. It's a very simple calculation. It's a very simple game. We, you know, we're just on this track um, and anything else is makes it more complicated and we're going to have to share power. And however many times you say New Zealand, it doesn't seem to go in. Like New Zealand, we've got a PR system. New Zealand Labour Party won on their own last time. You know, you just need to get over half the votes, basically. In, in, you know, even in, even even in a PR system, if you overwhelmingly win, you know, um, uh, a plurality, you you are probably still going to get a majority of the seats, depending on the system. Um, and and then in New Zealand, they chose to bring the Greens in. You know, they didn't have to actually. They just mm -hmm. chose to bring the Greens in because they changed the culture. And actually, I think some people are scared of that change of culture. Yes, you know, I, uh, I, yeah. I, I agree with you about the depth to which this is. I mean, I've just been, as I say, at the Electoral Reform Society where Rob Ford spoke, who's a professor of politics at the University of Manchester. And I mean, it's very, very hard to argue with his analysis if you look at all the data and the evidence, as you say, Alex, that 19 out of 20 elections since World War II, a progressive, broadly defined as non-conservative but everybody else in some formation obviously not the brexit party we've had a progressive majority in this country um, for most of the time since then all of the evidence shows that the current system has a bias against uh, left and center left parties um, but ultimately this isn't an evidence-based decision at the top of the tree now i think in the party membership it's about equity it's about fairness there's lots of Labour Party members who are in the Labour Party because maybe they've calculated at some point that it was a more uh, impactful choice than necessarily being in the Greens or the Lib Dems. I mean, I don't doubt that if we have PR, it will change the Labour Party. I think it will shrink the Labour Party. I don't think that's a problem. Um, but the nearer you get to power and the higher you, you know, the higher you get, in a way, the less rational the decisions come um and on your point of choice the thing that i think is really a problem for is it <clears throat> is the way that the political system the electoral system limits our policy choices 
because parties have to run after that small number of swing voters in marginal suite seats. And they tend to be a kind of crowded demographic of house owning, middle aged, uh, generally white. Um, you know, we all know the story. No one is running around at elections saying, I want to represent Wandsworth Road woman. You know, no one is running around saying, for me, it's that black woman with three kids who works for the council in Lambeth. They're running around saying, I need to represent Monbeo man, who is this 63 year old, nearly paid off his mortgage, who lives in a small town somewhere, because that's where the electoral system drives people. And at a more strategic level, and I don't know, we've got Zach and others here who, you know, work in the Green Party, but my feeling is that the electoral system in 2019 crowded out discussing climate change because we had, you know, the, the Brexit party forcing the Tories into a Brexit done position, the Labour Party reverting to bread and butter, let's just talk about the NHS, the thing we should have all been talking about, which was the planet frazzling and COP, which we knew was coming, basically bit the dust. So I think it crowds out political and policy choice. Um, and we have to really try to persuade our party leadership to actually just step up a little bit um really i don't i don't know if you'd agree with, with yeah that. i mean we have very binary elections and actually labor quite often chooses the wrong issue like 2015 we chose the nhs to fight an election on we got that wrong and my critique of that is is because people like i spoke to people on the doorstep didn't really believe the tories were going to privatize the nhs i know people everybody here probably find that laughable but there was a significant proportion of, of the voting public that didn't you know there, there, were, there were there were other issues than that but we chose to fight on ground that wasn't fertile to us and actually you need to you need to run elections on a multifaceted basis the economy always at the center because everything sort of revolves around that but you can have a really good discussion about a green economy green new deal all of those sort of things and then you can talk about actually you know you can you can center everything around the climate so you can center health around the climate air quality issues etc you can center education around the climate you can center every, all the other issues around the climate actually you can even center immigration policy around the climate because climate immigration is going to take over from sort of conflict immigration in the next 20 years of the biggest um, driver of immigration so um th th but having having a different electoral system will help form some of those conversations and some of those themes um, I'd actually, the next election, we will talk about climate, even if it's under first past the post, but then it will crowd other things out, you know, yeah. so, um, you know, I think it will crowd out stuff like social care, which is also an important issue, you know, so I think, I think there is, there is, um, there, there, there are lots of benefits for us changing the electoral system in terms of how we um, actually uh, see the elections through and how we sort of conduct the elections. That's brilliant. So look, I'm going to rather than asking people to post questions in the chat, I can see a couple of yellow hands up already. You're a disciplined lot. So I'm going to ask David and then James to unmute themselves. If you've got a quick question for Alex. Yes, on this question, uh, in the local party, we're already having people say who don't know that the rules have changed. How do we, we can obviously go back and say, and following Laura there, that the rules have changed, but the CLP members don't know this. Even if we can persuade the local constituency delegates to, to run a similar PR motion again, the key thing is, what can we do to influence the trade union vote? Unite as one big vote, but we need to do more to stand a chance of winning the vote at conference. What would you both Alex and Laura, what would you think we could do to make I mean, it worth running PR motions through CLPs again? Just to come to that last point first, I don't think we'd be, it'd be good, it'd be great if all the trade unions lined up and um, voted for the PR motion, but actually Unite is, a, is almost a third of the of their of the trade union section vote. And if they'd voted for it this time, it would have flown through. It would have been well over 60%. Um, for PR. So we do and we don't. It'd be great if we did, but numerically we don't. We just need to hold the vote we've got in the CLPs and add Unite on, on the other section. So that so that thing you just said, that's really important. So one, like if we went into conference and we had a few less CLPs passing the motion, I don't think that would really matter. But we, we just need to try and hold that. So one, we can look at, you know, the majority of CLPs didn't pass the motion for conference. So we can look at 
CLPs that didn't pass it this year, where where they actually support, where they've got a PR motion in theory, but chose something else for conference. And we know that it, there will be a bit of pushback because that there was tactical reasons why they didn't. My CLP, people tried to bring another motion to, to beat the PR motion and, and you know, and, and we organised for the PR motion to go through. So there needs to be some organising those places. But you're right. I think I think actually all the the coalition, so that coalition can write out in its constituent parts and as the coalition um, to you know Labour for a New Democracy coalition can write out to all of its um, uh, to all of its mailing lists and say actually we can bring the motion back, and the motion won't be exactly the same. It'll be similar, but it won't be exactly the same. I don't think we've written it yet, have we, Laura? But well, so we are. It's a very good point, David, that we must remind or indeed tell people that the rules have changed. We are, um, you know, pushing the motion out again. We probably start more in earnest in January. But I think the dynamics are different now. I mean, in the end, if you have 10 constituency Labour parties that pass a policy, the opening line of which is 80% of CLP delegates voted for this last time, then the fight becomes not about a mass and number of motions going to conference. It just becomes about making sure that it gets through the priority ballot. Um, so we spend our energy organising instead in the trade unions. And on that point, um, we're already in discussion. We've got a Unite for PR group going. We've got a Unison for PR group going. If you are in here somewhere, it doesn't matter what political party you're in. If you're in a trade union, um, please look on the Labour for New Democracy website um, and you can find links through to our organising in the different unions. We're also talking to the Unite leadership about how we can help fulfil their commitment to political education across Unite, because their own policy conference basically said, we don't like first past the post and we need to educate ourselves on alternatives. And we are, going, we are hoping as a coalition to do that for them. Um, and we are building a network of grassroots support through an organisation called Politics for the Many, which is staffed and has a board of people from uh, from the trade union movement so i don't underestimate the challenge but as alex says in the end we only need so many um so i am optimistic uh james newell i think i haven't got my specs on is that right yes <laughs> that, that's right thanks very much um i'd like to ask um i mean i must admit i'm a little bit sort of skeptical i'm just wondering how you would get the labor leadership to take uh PR on board, because I suppose the thought that goes through my mind is that if I were Keir Starmer uh, asking the electorate to make me prime minister, uh, uh, asking me, uh, the, the electorate to give me an absolute majority in parliament, I, I, uh, and I had in my manifesto uh, PR, um, I, I'd feel that my position was sort of slightly contradictory because, you know, o o o on the one hand, I would be asking uh, for uh, a, a policy which would make it much less likely to ever be able to win an overall majority of seats again. Um, but I was also asking for an overall majority under the present system, if you see what I mean. So, uh, you know, I can imagine having the, field, the, the media having a field day with that, saying, well, you don't really believe in the programme you're standing on in that case, you know. Um, I mean, it didn't affect the 97. It was, in, it, was in the, yeah, it was in the manifesto 97. Um, I mean, that also goes back to my first point. We don't make it a central part of the programme. It is just one thing in the manifesto. It is not that th we don't put it on a pledge card. You know, in a constituency like mine, I will talk about it because it's really popular in my constituency and it will undoubtedly, you know, help Labour show that we're a progressive party, which I think is one of our uh, issues at the moment. We don't have a suite of progressive policies for progressive voters like mine, right? And and we need we need to do that. So that that's an argument for it. Um, um, secondly, Helen Clark did exactly what you're saying in New Zealand. She went to the um, election on first past the post. Said we're going to change the electoral system. It wasn't a marquee thing in New Zealand. The economy was the marquee thing in in, in New Zealand in in the late nineties. And then she changed the electoral system. To be honest, nobody ever changed the electoral system. If you were like, well, you got elected on it, you have got to stick to it. You know, we, you know that 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 is just you know that's how change happens you know you're you're elected on one thing you say you're going to change you change it i don't think the press will go um, have a field down at all because actually um for all those reasons because the press are looking at issues that people are talking about and this is not an issue people are talking about you know actually and i know i'm in a aip and we all fought the good fight over brexit that was something lots of people were talking about and that was very high profile um but this isn't and also, you know, if you're actually talking about a left-right thing, 
that doesn't exist here as well because Nigel Farage will go out and say yes I support the change of the voting system and actually then what you've done is you, you've isolated the Tories so basically you're saying we all agree to this it's in all the manifestos apart from one um, and actually the other thing is is about um, the the support we've got so you know we're I'm not sure if we're over half of the shadow cabinet now since the reshuffle but we but, but we're around that point we're certainly over half of junior shadow ministers you know so so it's not like this is some minor thing by some some cranky bit of the the backbench of the PLP you know trying to drive the leadership this is the mainstream view of the PLP this is the mainstream view of the Labour Party this is the mainstream view of progressive voters in the country Yes, I would agree with that. I mean, actually, this was the golden opportunity for Keir to unite the party. And I think the PR campaign has illustrated that possibility because we've had people like Clive Lewis, who is obviously, you know, many of us will be one of our favourite MPs. Um, people like Ben Bradshaw, who may also be your favourite MP, but probably slightly less likely in this group. But, you know, uh, from two very different wings of the party, sharing platforms, people from all of the different factions. It's been a very, very inclusive campaign. I mean, it's overwhelming. You don't get 80% support unless you've pretty much united the party. So I would hope that Keir might wake up to that point. As someone has pointed out, of course, he's quite good at adopting policies and then binning them. <laughs> so it's not impossible uh, that he won't will adopt PR and, and then bin it. Or let's be optimistic that he won't adopt PR and then we'll do it anyway. And I think that, um, you know, the most likely scenario is that we have a minority Labour administration, at which point it is absolutely clear but the first thing that the Greens and the Liberal Democrats are going to say, you want us to play in whatever situation, whether it's a coalition, a confidence and supply arrangement, we need to reform the electoral system. Can, can, I, can, I just make, yeah. can I just make a point on that, Laura, that, you know, if, if Labour don't win, and obviously I'm a Labour MP, I want Labour to get at least 325 seats and form majority government, but say that we don't manage that, wouldn't it be better for us to have it in the manifesto rather than look like we're dragged to do it by the Lib Dems? Um, because, you know, the reality is, no offence to Zach and the Greens, they're not going to be the difference between us forming a majority government and not. I don't think we're going to be through in 24 and go like, yeah, Caroline Lucas, we're over the line now. Um, it is going to be Lib Dems and potentially a whole, you know, rainbow yeah. suite of people to get us to 325. And they're all going to say, well, we need to vote, change the voting system. And then and then if that's the only way we're going to get in the government, we, that's probably what will happen. It's better than say, yeah, look, we, we put this in our manifesto, we're going forward, this is something we're always going to do, we're going to work with you on it, and then we can have an argument with the other partners about the form and all of that, which is, you know, a lovely argument to have. Um, but as long as it's done by the next election, that's fine. You know, if if we don't have it, and we just sort of ignored it, then it looks like, then, then in the following election, who will claim credit for it? The Liberal Democrats. And actually, sort of the reverse of that happened in the coalition, but they got punished for all the things they said they would do, like abolish tuition fees and then you had £9,000 fees. But actually with Labour, they would achieve it. And so they could actually do better rather than doing worse. And if if we're not ahead of that, you know, so we need to be ahead of that. I think there is there is some there are some elements where there's this triangulation around a certain group of voters and they've forgotten, you know, actually that that that, that people can go everywhere and that other political dynamics are at play. They're sort of thinking that, that, that there's, a, there's a stationary sort of point in time with other parties and that will carry on being stationary while we're going to move forward. Actually, everybody's going to move forward. And we need to be alive to how that's going to play out. And this is a really important part of that. Yes, I would agree absolutely with that. And I think even the step before, you know, if you think about the way, and I'm sure as pro-Europeans, we are all feeling this. I mean, one of the things I like about Open Labour, and I know it's worked with uh, people like Mary, who I can see in the middle of my screen, um, is your commitment to internationalism. And, you know, I think many of us are feeling a bit sore, quite honestly, that Keir has not been more forthcoming in his pro-European views, in fact, quite the contrary. Um, if you think about the fed up remain camp, many of those people, though not entirely, are electoral reformers. You know, they've got general commitment to democratic systems. They want to talk about citizens assemblies. They like participatory democracy. If the Labour Party isn't offering something to what we might broadly call the pro-democracy internationalist wing of British electorate, which is Lib Dem, Green, Labour and non-aligned, 
he's going to have some trouble, you know, including, for example, in this in the, the famous Red Wall, because contrary to popular belief that, you know, the minute you live in Cone Valley, you're some sort of tub thumping little nationalist. There are lots of progressives in those seats as well. And if the Labour Party isn't offering those voters something come the next election, some of them may actually just decide to go elsewhere. So there is an electoral case for Labour as well. But then I think a very pragmatic point that you make, Alex, it'd be much better to get ahead of this, embrace it positively. And in fact, I would say, and given that Keir definitely is taking a steer from, um, you know, Mandelson and, and uh, times past, I mean, if you think about it, this is, this is unfinished business from the last Labour government. You know, if you really want to be Blair too, well then be Blair too, because by now, Blair would have introduced PR. I mean, you know, Labour introduced the devolved administrations with PR systems in them. So, uh, you know, I, I remain hopeful that Keir will embrace this. I think Seam is probably about to send me a message saying that I've got to shut up. But is there one more question from Derek for Alex? Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, um, it, this might be a bit of a detail maybe, but I just want, was thinking about in terms of how we sell this to the wider electorate. What would the um, what would the actual sort of like the chamber look like under PR? Would, would we be talking about initially sort of like the same the actual chamber now, the House of Commons, just with a PR system? Because I think it ties into a bit about sort of issues of sovereignty and stuff and Brexit and all that. If you're if you're trying to make the case for something which is talking about a whole new chamber, um, which might be might be really good, but that may i can see that switching off a certain you know kind of part of the electorate i guess i yeah, mean, I I mean by, by the good. chamber in the physical chamber I, I mean i'd like nothing more than us having like um you know chamber like most of the rest of the world where everybody has their own seat everybody has their own microphone everybody has their usb own usb port that's particularly important um uh but i'm afraid to say that that I think that's much more difficult to achieve than PR. I think PR would be much easier to achieve than change the physical aspects of the chamber. In terms of maybe like the numerical thing, I think also changing 650. I think actually 650, if you look at it, the Italian parliament 600. And so 650 is about right if, if, if that's the comparator in terms of population size. I'm just choosing them because they've got a PR system and, and the 650, 600 works. Saying we should have 400 or 800. I'm not sure. I mean, 400, definitely, you wouldn't get a lot of support from that. And 800, maybe a bit too many, especially if we didn't get a new chamber, we would struggle as, as we are. So I think, um, I think keep the eye, eye, you know, your eyes on the prize when you change the voting system. And then maybe once you change it, once you've had an election or two uh, under that new system, we can go, well, this isn't working. And then we can change the chamber. Yeah, I think I'd probably agree with that. Um... Uh, are there any other questions for Alex? It's not every day. We have an MP born in Leeds in the 1970s. I have no bias here at all, but I have to think that being born in the Leeds in the 1970s was a great thing. Why oh. did they put two people born in Leeds in the 1970s together, Laura? That's, uh, you know, that was a clever <laughs> move, wasn't it? <laughs> no bias at all in our selection of MP here. Julie Ward has popped up with a nice beanie hat. Yeah, so I've just been out at the Nota Hasakfield demonstration to try and close down the horrendous detention centre here in County Durham. Um, uh, it's great to see you, Alex. Um, I, I really th think we've got to talk about how, uh, how a different system would empower more women, would empower more black and minority ethnic people to stand. Um, and I have noticed that every person who asked a question so far was a man. Right. And it's often because women take a back seat. They've got to be at the forefront and we have to win the argument with women, uh, with um, black and minority ethnic communities uh, and just demonstrate that we would have a more representative system if we only had a PR, if we had a different system. So maybe you could t speak to that point. Yeah, I, th I think there's lots of reasons why that would happen. But I think the biggest reason is because we'd have a change of culture. So I don't think actually the numerical distribution of votes being um, seats being more similar to votes would engender that. But I think the cultural change it would engender would bring more diverse group of people forward. You know, I'm, I'm you know, um, second generation immigrant. It's it's and, and you talk to other people who are first, second generation immigrants. 
there's quite a big barrier to overcome in the UK. I mean, the other thing that we need is a codified constitution because nobody understands how the bloody country works, including most MPs who are inside Parliament. I mean, going through the Brexit thing, you learn so much about our unwritten constitution, um, half which I've already forgotten. So um, I think I think that, that, that there, are, there are lots of reasons why those two things actually are probably interlinked. I think we need to do the PR first. Um, but we need a constitu new constitutional convention, new constitutional settlement and codified constitution. And I think then people know where they are in the country and they uh, know how it works and it would then be easier to access. And that's also a reason why, you know, you so many people from establishment backgrounds, as in they go to Eton, they go to Oxford, they do PPE, they work in the Conservative Party usually, and they work in industry or public affairs or for a hedge fund like Jacob Rees Mogg or established one because somebody gave them a load of money. Um, and and that and that and then they've they're you know born to rule and they understand the system and their and their school looks like the chamber of the house comes is another good reason why we should change it you know and all the rest of it and why we need to to change how what the institution looks like the culture of the institution and how people understand it from the get-go you know because creating the mystery around it effectively freezes people out you know we've created we've created hogwarts you've got to be picked out you've got to be a wizard you know, not a muggle, and you've got to be picked out of the hat. That's where we are, you know, it's my Harry Potter analogy, why well, everybody should be able to access it. <laughs> yes, and it's interesting talking to people, obviously, as I, I mean, I, I'm i just someone who thought it was not fair that my vote never counted, to be honest, as, a, as an entry into this, and then I went to an event which Stephen Kinnock spoke at, and he was brilliant on just explaining, you know, how it worked in Wales. Um, but I've always found it amusing when people say to me, oh, but if you have a particular sort of PR and you have these party lists and the party will control, and I just think you've no idea how much parties already control and how much power they have through the patronage of the so-called safe seat. That, you know, I mean, you imagine someone, actually I happen to think he's a very nice guy and a good MP, but Dan Carden got elected at the age of what, 30 or something. He literally, never has to write another CV or go to a job. I mean, he could be the MP for Liverpool Walton until he's 100. Hell will freeze over before Liverpool Walton votes anything other than Labour. Now, he's a nice guy, but what a crazy system in which at one point in 2017, somebody from a union probably decided that, you know, Billy Bob Watsit was the right person for this seat. And we've given away that power for ever. Now, if that was a list, at least would have maybe given a bit of power to a man and a woman, <laughs> you know, or maybe a person of colour, or maybe, heaven's sake, someone disabled. You know, the Labour Party has got one um, sort of, I don't want to say out, to, you know, Labour Party has many MPs with, with disabilities, but there is one sort of profile disabled MP in the Labour Party. It's absolutely shocking. We cannot, but I mean, that's the other thing I always say to people. Look, the alternative system might not be perfect, but is there anything about the current one you'd like to defend? From the quality of the MPs we get to the quality of the cabinet we get, the quality of the government we get, the quality of the legislation we get, the state of the bloody country. Brexit was probably in large part a result of the electoral system. It, it sort of staggers me that Labour just doesn't go, you know what, guys, couldn't be much worse than this. Let's give it a shot. And after all, if we change the electoral system, you know, Care doesn't have to sign in blood that it'll be like that for the next 150 years. Actually, the chances are we won't change it back again. Um, but, but yes, I think we've been woefully let down by this and it really is time that the Labour Party uh, <laughs> woke up to all of this. I'm going to end with Mary Calder, who normally has intelligent questions. And then I'm going to hand uh, to Alex and then Alex, you'll have the final say and then we're going to give us all back to Seema. Um. I just thought I'd join in because I saw Zach's comment on the chat where he said, I don't actually agree that PR isn't an election winning um, issue. And I think I agree with him. I mean, not that we necessarily need to frame it as PR, but in an earlier session, we were talking about appealing to emotions. And the thing that really appealed to Brexit voters was take back control the feeling that nobody was listening to them. So if we could frame something around giving everyone a, vo a voice or something like that, and as a kind of democratic revolution, I think that would be incredibly popular. Alex? 
I think I think I, mean, I never disagree with Mary. Um, Mary's a brilliant person, uh, particularly on international stuff, and she's really helped her and Luke Cooper's on the call as well. And Julie have really helped open Labour in um, our work around international um, international policy. Um, but actually, thinking about that, we need to look at international comparisons of other countries that, that that have got better um, democratic systems than ours. And there's a, there's a range of things that they have. And it's not just about changing the, the electoral system low chamber. If we said we're going to do all of these things, and the hot topic at the moment, obviously, is, you know, MP second jobs and cronyism. So if, if we do a whole package of things of which electoral reform is one, absolutely. And we can talk about cleaning up politics. So we're going to clean up politics. So we're taking back control. We're going to clean up politics. That'd be popular. But we wouldn't say we're clean up politics. And all we're going to do is change the electoral system. Thank you very much. And good night. But if we had a whole range of things in the manifesto, which that was one, then absolutely. Uh, but but sort of my point about the about my, my whole thing about elections, you don't want to get in my philosophy of elections is that you need to um, talk to people about the issue they are interested in, right? And if you have our entire UK electorate, everybody's interested in other in different things, and you you know you need a lot of data and intelligence to work out exactly who's interested in what. And that's what we specialise in my constituency. We really target messages. Not what we don't do is say to one person, we believe in this, the other person that we believe in the opposite thing. What we do is say, we know you're interested in this. This is what we think about this. We're going to tell you about this. We're not going to tell you about 10 other things that you're not interested about. And so when we, we know more broadly who's interested in electoral reform, we tell them we're interested. In, we know a lot of other people are definitely not interested and we don't talk to them about that. And I think that's the way we need to get a lot smarter about it. If somebody says, I don't care about the voting system, us spending an hour trying to tell them that we should change it is, I'm sorry to say, I feel a waste of time. Um, but where people are interested, we need to really communicate that. And we need to have, you know, we need to have an internal discussion about winning people over on our own side first, um, and then and then about how we frame it in an election. But us going to the leadership saying, we're gonna have a big fight to make this the number one issue, and we're gonna do the whole election about this, is almost a way of us failing. We need to say this is a part of a palette of things and it appeals to a certain demographic of voters which Labour need. And so we need to talk to them about it. And then maybe it's in a broader in a broader category of things which the Labour Party really signed up to the moment about cleaning up politics, about MP second jobs, around cronyism, around Nolan principles of public life, around um, the unwritten constitution, which is also slightly um, not exact, not everybody's on board with, but a lot of people are. You know, and we can even talk about uh, having an unelected second chamber again, which is a contested issue. But again, a lot of people want to change that. So it's about that broad palette of things. I would agree with that tactically within the party. I think you're absolutely right. If we'd gone with a this must be the number one policy, it won't be a policy at all. Um, it is a big issue for some people and it's a low salience issue for most others. But and I think we may be too late. I do think the Labour Party has missed an opportunity to take a big positive yes indeed i agree with zach polanski take back control agenda you know we are in democratic crisis and it's obvious to people and it might just be because you've been trying for weeks to speak to the council about i don't know the woman three doors down who you think has died six weeks ago and the house is infested with rats and you can't speak to her in the council because there were no council staff you know, we could talk to people about what democratic crisis means. It doesn't have to mean a written constitution or electoral reform. It just means joining the dots. And what I think the Labour Party is, and others must speak for their own parties, but what I think we're not doing is joining the dots. Because if we were joining the dots, it's obvious that how you elect the people who ultimately are the most powerful people in the land must be one of those dots. Now, it's not the only dot, but I think ordinary folk, when encouraged to join these dots can do it because they're seeing all the things that you've just listed, you know, um, from second, third, fourth jobs. I mean, MPs earning more in their spare time than many working families would earn a couple in three years. I mean, I don't think it takes a genius to say to somebody on the doorstep, something's bust in that system. It just takes political will. Um, so look, I am now going to actually stop. I want to thank Alex Sobel, who is a brilliant supporter of Mother Europe and Open Labour and Green and electoral reform. 
Um, and if there is any interest um, in continuing the discussion about PR, please come along to um, Labour for a New Democracy. If you're a Labour member in particular, if you're not a Labour member but you want to do PR campaigning, check out Make Votes Matter, which is a cross-party organisation. And if you're in a trade union, please check out on the Labour for a New Democracy website um, how you can get involved in your trade union. And thank you for your forbearance, you non-Labour people, but we are going to do this. <laughs> Just hang in there. <laughs>